Um, so uh, good evening and welcome to our first community meeting uh, as part of the Town of Randolph's and Two Rivers at Aquichi Regional Planning Commission's area-wide planning study uh, for downtown Randolph. Uh, I'm Josh Jerome, Director of Economic Development and Zoning for the Town of Randolph. Uh, and before we begin with tonight's program, I just wanna provide some context as to why we're here tonight. Um, over the past few years, Randolph has taken some positive steps uh, in reimagining what the community wants to be, uh, although change is always difficult to effectuate. I believe most people would agree that the R3 process was a catalyst for this momentum and contributed a great deal to why we are here now. It brought the community together and provided a container for residents to develop priorities for focused assessment and action. As human capital in the community activated, disparate projects such as the hotel and outdoor recreation hub, new bike shop, and new food establishments have provided fuel to sustain momentum of positive change in Randolph's economic sector. Increased capacity on the municipal level has resulted in additional community programming, events, and focus on larger projects with a regional significance. Randolph is the commercial core of the region and largest township by population in Orange County. Um, in order for downtown Randolph to continue with this positive momentum and to accommodate future growth, municipal officials have been working to develop a reinvestment plan to replace the North Reservoir and bring on new wells to eliminate the use of the Pearl Street well, which has been the source of high levels of manganese in our water system. We first applied for and were awarded a Northern Borders Regional Commission grant in the fall of 2019, then applied and were awarded uh, Vermont Community Development Program funds in the beginning of this year to help fund that project. As it stands now, we are about 90% done of the final design plans and are slated to begin the project next spring and complete it by fall. This project was originally intended for this year, but COVID's impact has delayed it. As we have developed the reinvestment plan for the reservoir and wells, we have concurrently taken stock of our municipal assets and identified action steps necessary to utilize those assets. The Branchwood parcel on Pearl Street is the largest unused municipal asset in the downtown. Conversations last year between the town and Two Rivers over the Branchwood parcel resulted in a phase one environmental assessment by VHB to initially assess the site's contamination. Being a site where fire destroyed the commercial building in 1999 and not having conclusive results from the remediation, further inspection was warranted. We then applied for enrollment in the state's Brownfields Reuse and Environmental Liability Limitation Program, otherwise known as BRELA, and were accepted earlier this year. This provides liability coverage to the town and any future owner over any contamination. A phase two environmental assessment began this past summer. You might have noticed the area has been roped off to prevent vehicular traffic. Some of the findings of that phase two assessment will be discussed later by VHB. For clarity, the Branchwood parcel is not the source of elevated manganese from the Pearl Street well. Manganese is a naturally occurring mineral derived from the bedrock. As the town, Two Rivers, and VHB have worked together to complete the environmental assessment, Two Rivers suggested a more holistic approach with an area-wide planning study, and municipal officials believe this initiative can strengthen our objective of investing in this underutilized asset and identify additional underutilized assets that have redevelopment potential in the downtown. Your participation here tonight is both for your edification and ours, so that we may align our opportunities with needs. And I'll hand it over to you, Kevin, at Two Rivers. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, Sarah, next slide there, I think. And I'm Kevin Geiger, I'm the Director of Planning at Two Rivers, Ottaquichi Regional Commission, and we are the folks who have the money from EPA to hire uh, folks like VHB to assess the site and to do this area-wide planning study. Um, and so I'm going to talk about for Branchwood for a second. Uh, you may all be familiar with Branchwood. Branchwood is kind of on the southeastern corner of the downtown. It has two parcels, actually. The parcel you may be more familiar with, the smokestack um, on the railroad side, 
of Pearl Street. Anna, that does have another parcel on the south side of Pearl Street there. So we're going to be talking about that and other properties tonight. Uh, I want to talk about area-wide planning in general. That term, we use that term to talk about um, two parts an area-wide plan does. It looks at environmental constraints around sites, and then it looks at reuse potential and reuse possibilities. And the idea is a lot of sites have issues of one kind or another, in, in, especially in any urban context or that had previous commercial use. That slows them down from redevelopment. But what we really need for redevelopment is we need a vision for a future, a picture of, of what do we want um, this thing to be besides just a vacant lot, perhaps. And there's a, a lot of possibilities. And so tonight we're gonna talk with you about all those things. Um, this is the agenda right now. So we're gonna do our introductions and some housekeeping stuff. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, redevelopment opportunities and constraints. And then we're gonna have some brief question and answer. That's gonna take us about 45 minutes in or so, but then we're gonna really get down to talking about the parcels in particular and getting some feedback from you on which parcels we should focus on, uh, Branchwood and, and others, and, um, and the potential reuses out there. And I think there's one more slide here for me. Yep. So just hold all the questions um, until the end. Again, about 40 minutes or so from now, we're gonna have a, a good time for questions um, from all of the presentations that we're about to do. Uh, you can raise your hand if you wanna speak when we get to that question answer thing, literally raise your hand and wave it at us, or you can use uh, down bottom, you can use the reactions, and there's there's a, a raise hand uh, thing down there. There is, uh, yes, there should be. Sometimes you can use the wave hand, there's a wave hand down there too, and, and that'll work equally well. Uh, remain muted, uh, you'll see a little red microphone with a little slash through it, that'll mean you're muted. Uh, if you're not speaking, that'll be good, that'll save everybody uh, listening to stuff. And obviously, uh, be respectful and courteous as we go along tonight. Um, I want to point out that when we're talking about parcels, uh, those have been uh, identified preliminarily as parcels with, number one, within the downtown area, but also with good reuse potential out there. And we're going to be talking about them tonight. That doesn't mean that the landowners have said, oh, pick me on these parcels. And it doesn't mean that what we come up with is necessarily uh, going to happen you know, the, the, on that site. This is an exploration of opportunities uh, for, for folks. And then as we go forward, and it's not the end, it's the beginning of that process a little bit. Um, let's see, just about some other things. Uh, again, as we get a little later, we're gonna be looking at potential priority uses uh, for sites. And then we're gonna to try to do a deep dive, uh, picking the Branchwood site, which we're already working on and another site out there. And these are the focus areas. You can see the outline in red. The yellow is your central business district. So we have Branchwood on the, on the edge there. But we've got one parcel on the north side, several parcels on the south side. Um, you might think about the Playhouse Theater and other stuff that's down there. And then, and then way out uh, near the railroad crossing, there's some uh, previously industrial properties out there as well in the purple. Again, yep, so we're gonna be talking about potential reuses. So the use, because the use drives the reuse. If, if there's a parcel, but nobody wants to do anything with it, nothing's gonna happen. But if they say, oh, and it can be all sorts of things. It doesn't need to be a commercial use. It could be a public use. It could be a green space. It could be housing. It could be all sorts of things. And it could be a combination of those. And again, the, the catalyst site is that Branchwood site, both sides of the street. And um, what are that, those design priorities? What are the things that the community really wants to have happen on those sites? And so now I think we're going to go to Denise. Right, Denise, are you gonna lead off the next part? Yes, and Greg's going to share his screen with the slides. Um, go good evening. Sharing. My name is Denise Roy, and I'm an environmental engineer with VHB. And I'm here with two of my colleagues, Greg McDonald, also another environmental engineer, and Mark Hamlin, who's a senior planner with VHB. And we've uh, performed work at the Branchwood site 
to date and also are um, driving the uh, area-wide plan. Um, one component of that is the environmental desktop review. So Greg and I are going to go through their, our findings from the environmental desktop review. And this is just one of the pieces of information that's going to feed into our discussion tonight for reuse and uh, potential considerations. So an environmental desktop review is really a high level evaluation of an area for environmental concerns. And so the area is the focus area that Kevin showed before with several parcels um, all in downtown Randolph. And it includes that former Branchwood site. Um, but it's the the review is very high level in that there, there isn't a site visit, there are no interviews. It's looking at databases, uh, federal and state databases, um, maps. And so that's why it's called a desktop review because we could essentially do it from our computers. Um, and we're looking for uh, indications of um, you know, former uses that may indicate potential for release of any sort of hazardous materials. Um, and any sort of other potential contamination that could impact redevelopment. So that's really the objective is just to kind of lay the groundwork and say, okay, do we see any red flags here? And how could this impact redevelopment? So that includes looking at the physical setting, the, the groundwater flow directions, um, surface water, uh, soils, those sorts of things, also historical uses. So a uh, property that was, that's been vacant for 200 years is uh, much different than a property that was used um, for a dry cleaner or for um, another industrial type of purpose. Um, we also are looking at sites that are nearby or in the area that are regulated sites with the DEC. Um, those have known contaminant conditions and or suspected contaminant conditions and they're enrolled in their programs. So Greg is now going to go through the um, the details of that environmental desktop review and then I will come back and kind of summarize things and talk about Branchwood a bit. Yep so uh, like Denise said um, my name is Greg McDowell I'm with VHB uh, I've been working on the area-wide plan um, as well and whenever we started, we um, we looked at the focus area, um, which Kevin already started to, to describe, and we essentially divided it up into four different blocks. So we have the west block, which is the area out along Weston Street by the railroad crossing, uh, what we've defined as the north block, which is uh, two smaller parcels to the north of sort of the central downtown area, uh, central block, which contains more of that um, central business district and then the east block which contained just those two different branchwood parcels um, and and we divide this up as a as a way to sort of organize um, our review and also be able to focus on um, the properties within the focus area uh, blocks as well as in the immediate vicinity like Denise said where maybe there's identified conditions um, that that could pose a potential um, a potential uh, redevelopment consideration on a parcel within the block. Um, so it, to sort of dig into a high level summary of the uh, findings of of our environmental desktop review, like Denise said, we looked at a lot of um, historical uses at these properties, tried to identify places where there was documented. Um, storage or use of petroleum products or other hazardous materials. Um, and it, typically we can we can look at these historical uses um, as a good uh, as a good understanding of, of potential for environmental impacts at a property. Um, so for example, if, if we're looking at a gas station, we know most times that gas stations have some sort of underground tank system where they're storing petroleum products. Um, unfortunately, we've come to learn that these tanks are, are, have historically been known to cause releases to the subsurface. So that's sort of a, 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 an, example of, um, an example of how we're looking at these past uses. So generally speaking, uses within the area, aren't, none are, are extremely surprising. Um, the West Block out on Weston Street, we have a lot of woodworking use. Um, uh, wood products and, and lumber processing out there, as well as some commercial um, 
uses um, historically. As we look more into the central block, this is obviously where you have a more diverse range of uses. Um, if we look back um, to the early turn of the century, you have a, a lot more use associated with fuel storage, um, blacksmithing, some, some more um, his, uh, some older style uses. And then we get more into auto repair, maintenance garages, gasoline stations, and there's always been a general commercial presence in the downtown area. Um, the North Block, largely residential uses were recognized. Um, and then as was mentioned with the Branchwood property, um, that, that was a wood products manufacturing um, and has had some residential use on, on the other side of uh, Pearl Street there on the south side. Um, and, and when we're looking at these uses, these are, it's important to note that this is in some ways speculation, but it's, it's we're, we're looking at these uses, the storage of materials, handling of those materials, and like Denise said, looking at those state and federal databases to try to develop a better understanding of what potential constraints for redevelopment um, may be present. Um, so then sort of a, a bigger summary of how this all relates back to the area-wide plan. So the big takeaway from the environmental desktop review is, is that there's no environmental conditions within the focus area that appear to preclude redevelopment. Um, there's no property here that's that appears or is documented to be contaminated beyond a, a threshold that it would make sense to redevelop, which isn't surprising. Um, there are multiple DEC regulated sites um, that have a combination of known and perceived impacts um, associated with them some within the focus area, some outside of the focus area. Um, there's many properties that have current and former underground storage tanks, that's USTs and above ground storage tanks, which are ASTs. These are common, um, especially in, in uh, older and urbanized areas, even with residences, it's, it's a risk that that's something that should be considered and, and looked into. Um, with any urban area, there's, there's the potential for what we would consider urban soils or potential fill. Um, so that's typically, uh, that's typically seen anywhere where there's a historical industrial presence. Um, associated with the three DEC regulated sites, there are, like I said, documented releases. So there, there's documented releases of um, fuel to groundwater in, in the central, uh, in, in that focus, within portions of the focus area. And then the last piece that we pulled out is buildings that are constructed prior to the 1980s, there's, there's a concern or there's a potential for, um, there's a, the potential for uh, potentially hazardous building materials to be used, building materials that are asbestos containing, lead-based paints, which people are probably familiar with, PCB containing paints or coatings or other building materials. So that's just another piece uh, that we sort of pull in in this desktop review to uh, add into an additional consideration as we look forward at, at sort of the next steps. Um, and, and it's important, like I've said, that this is all preliminary, it's research. Um, none of the impacts had been, have been confirmed and we don't know anything about any of these properties with certainty until it's tested under current conditions. Um, and with that said, I'll pass it back to Denise um, and she'll sort of discuss the, the process moving forward with the findings of the desktop review. Thanks, Greg. So moving forward with any of these sites that are in this focus area, for our recommendations, we would recommend that a particular site, if it was, we are looking at it for redevelopment, um, that it would go through a formal um, ASTM phase one environmental site assessment. The work that we did is kind of um, a higher level than that. It doesn't get into actually looking being present on the site and an, uh, a phase one would ha include interviews it would include a more thorough document review uh, with other records at the town um, a site 
visit, taking pictures, so site reconnaissance. So it gets the um, the result of uh, an ASTM compliant phase one is that it it'll um, evaluate for the presence of recognized environmental conditions and it will list out what are recognized environmental conditions for a particular site. And by starting the process this way, it offers potential liability protections, um, innocent homeowner protections uh, for uh, prior to any development, um, which is part of what we're finding out or working through with Branchwood. Um, after a phase one is performed, if um, there are recognized environmental conditions, often it's recommended to do a phase two environmental site assessment. Um, and that's to get some samples to get on site to analyze the soil, maybe look at the groundwater, do um, a more uh, detailed review and get some data uh, because the phase one does not get into data for soil and groundwater. Um, and after that, you can, if you have known environmental conditions, then you start looking at corrective actions and what you can do. And so I've got listed here remediation, mitigation, and institutional controls. Uh, these aren't very complicated remediation could be very um, simply digging up an area of soil and trucking it off site. Mitigation could be putting down some sort of engineered barrier, which could be pavement um, or a building footprint or foundation. Um, institutional controls is a uh, land use restriction sometimes uh, that you know somebody can't dig below this certain level without uh, having an environmental professional um, do a review for that. So they don't need to be complicated. Um, and then we went through this process for Branchwood through Two Rivers um, and an EPA Brownfield assessment grant. Um, we performed a phase one and a phase two. The phase two investigation is complete. It's documented and currently it's being reviewed by the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. That's the, the DEC that um, Kevin posted that in the chat there and also the Environmental Protection Agency, so the EPA. So they're reviewing that and so it's not finalized yet. Um, we have a figure here next that looks at the um, the layout for Branchwood. And so this is that parcel. It's it's divided into two pieces, uh, north and south of Pearl Street. So the footprint for the, the former mill is the purple stripe area. And then there were also former lumber storage areas. And there was a railroad spur that came off of the line. Um, and there they had coal storage um, and they uh, presumably would, you know, import and export materials and that sort of thing. There are also a couple of residential buildings on that south piece. Um, so we, uh, after looking, after um, performing the phase one, we uh, performed a phase two, which included soil and groundwater sampling, putting in a couple of wells for groundwater on um, the entire parcel, both the north side and the south side. And results um, show that um, they're basically just shallow soil impacts that are associated with the former uses. So that former wood manufacturing building had an incinerator where they incinerated waste. So that's burning things, burning waste. And also um, the mill caught on fire and, and, and burnt in 1999. And there was the railroad spur and the railroad nearby. And so those former uses, as well as um, potentially using it as a snow dump um, and some other things have um, have uh, caused some, some soil impacts on surface soil and it's con uh, contaminants that are really common, uh, particularly in urban areas. So, and they're not contaminants that migrate. So it's just in the surface soil at this point, we uh, have proposed to do additional sampling further to further down to see if it goes beyond the one and a half foot depth level. Um, and so that is still in review with the DEC and the EPA. We also looked at groundwater and there's no evidence of um, impacts to groundwater. So that is still in process and you know this site as well as any other sites that we might be looking at for catalyst sites, there are funding sources available and that particularly Two Rivers can talk about that um, and some of the 
other uh, groups on this call for helping to assess and remediate uh, sites that may have some sort of impacts. And so there are resources available to help move these forward because oftentimes it's a perceived barrier for development. And so that helps. Sarah? Thank you very much, Denise and Greg. Um, I'm going to go ahead, if you could stop sharing, Greg, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here to come back to our slides. So hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Raitt, and um, I work as a regional planner here at Two Rivers on Kuchu Regional Commission. I'm going to uh, talk for just a few minutes about noise impacts, which are good to consider for any development project. So what's the level of background noise um, for the specific and in the specific area? And is that appropriate for the future land use that we're considering? Those sort of questions. This evening, I'm only going to be talking about noise from the perspective of how to fund a project, a redevelopment project. So the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, um, funds many housing projects across the country, particularly affordable housing, um, and they can also fund development of some community facilities, buildings, spaces, that sort of thing. So many folks do look to HUD when they're thinking about how they're going to build up their capital stacks for a redevelopment project. But there are some limitations on what can be funded, and noise is part of that eligibility analysis. So HUD, funny, HUD money excuse me, cannot be used to construct buildings in areas where the background noise level is above 75 decibels. And creating outdoor spaces in those high noise areas is also tricky. HUD probably would not fund a park in that kind of an area, but a parking lot um, that's ancillary to a different project might be fundable because a parking lot is not considered a noise sensitive use. If the noise is between 65 and 75 decibels, then you might be able to use HUD dollars for a building project, but the building would need to include noise mitigation features like insulation, uh, double pane windows, that sort of thing. And a couple important caveats. HUD does look at additional environmental concerns uh, when it's deciding whether to fund a project. And so even if the noise levels are below 75 decibels in a specific site, HUD might still end up deciding not to fund a project there for other reasons. Um, also, noise analyses and mitigation requirements are incredibly site specific. Um, and so you don't know for certain whether a redevelopment project is fundable through HUD until you really dig into the details of, of that unique site context. That said, all of that said, in Randolph, we know that we have some significant noise impacts from the train horns that have to be sounded before the train reaches an, an accurate road crossing. Um, and so the state estimates that the decibel levels are probably at 75 or above within a radius of 125 feet of the tracks. So using spatial data that was very generously shared by Todd Sheffer of SRW Environmental Consulting and Julie Ifland um, from RACDC, we've used that 125 foot rough rule of thumb to map these um, high noise zones. And so the high noise zones are in red um, and the study focus area parcels are in yellow and where they overlap is orange. So you can see that quite a few study parcels could be impacted by high noise levels in those orange areas then most projects would not be fundable through HUD. Again, this is just a, a rough guess, um, and an actual HUD project review would look in depth at the unique characteristics of an individual site and its surroundings, but it is worth keeping this constraint in mind um, if the town's going to be considering redevelopment projects that might depend on HUD dollars, like a subsidized housing unit complex or a community facility. So at this point, I am going to pass it over to uh, Mr. Doug Kennedy of Doug Kennedy Advisors, who's going to be presenting, um, pardon me, I'm just going to share his slides. Um, he's gonna be presenting a housing and commercial market um, analysis for us. So Doug, are you online? I'm here. Wonderful, and can you see your slides? I can see them. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. You want to make them bigger? That would be great. Um, Absolutely. Okay. I just very quickly, I'm Doug Kennedy. I'm an independent planner and economist from Norwich. Um, 
My what I do is to work with private developers and communities um, throughout the U.S. and with a focus in this part of the world on development issues. What um, what makes sense on a particular site or in a community, um, um, and to look at some of the feasibility issues behind a new development. In Randolph, I'm specifically looking at residential or housing potentials or um, commercial potentials for. Uh, for new development. My findings and my recommendations, which I'll finish up with here, are not necessarily specific to a site in downtown Randolph, but are um, specific to the community. In other words, it's a potential that could, um, if it fits on one of the sites, that would be great. Um, but these are things that work from an economic and market perspective. Um, they might compete with existing built existing built uh, businesses or housing developments in Randolph, but they make sense in terms of the, the uh, current economic um, situation. So, Sarah, if you'll move to the next slide. So, first of all, uh, one of the things I do is to take a good background look at a community, what's going on from an economic perspective. Some of these graphics may mean a lot to you. Some may be way too much detail but I'll just go through them quickly and give you a feeling of what I find as being important um, in any community. This particular graphic throws, shows three different things over time. That is since 2000, the year 2000. The red line is the size of the labor force in, Rand in the Randolph labor market area. It's Randolph and surrounding towns. The green line is actual employment in that area and the Purple or blue line, however, that may show up for you is the unemployment rate. And obviously, um, what happened, what most recently happened with unemployment was that there was a huge, big jump in two, 2020, very much a factor of um, COVID. Um, but what's more significant here is that gradual downward trend in both the size of the labor force and total employment in the, in the community. Um, the, there obviously there was a real loss of jobs back around 2010, a couple of major employers moved out. What's, what's happening in Randolph and what's happening in other communities throughout Vermont is that a lot of people are aging out of the labor force. Um, so that's an age thing, that's a demographic thing. Not much we can do about that. What's happened more recently is it appears that a number of people are not returning to the labor force following unemployment during COVID. Um, and that's an ongoing factor. These are two things that it's, if you will, it's a, it's a shrinking sphere of economic influence in the town. Nevertheless, um, if you look at the bottom there, wages in the area have increased by 44%, average wages, um, at a higher level than Vermont. Uh, as a whole. Um, and what I note in particular about Randolph is that the major employers are um, it, you know, institutions and employers that create high level uh, positions and, have, and who have been fairly stable recently. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. Um, another interesting thing I always look at is real estate activity. Um, that is sales of, um, you know, houses, of typical single family homes, condominiums, those sorts of things. This graph shows from uh, the year 215 to 2020 trends for Randolph and red, uh, Orange County as a whole, and sort of the yellow or orange, and Vermont in green. And what's really striking here, you, you look at the labor force and employment, um, it's down in, in the Randolph area, and yet uh, residential real estate activity is dramatically up, 80% higher than it was in the year 2015, and a really big bump in year 2020. Um, so while there may be fewer jobs in the town, this tells me that there's interest in the, in the community from a residential perspective. I just happened to look today at listings. There are only 12 residential listings in uh, Randolph today. Um, and none of them are be between the prices of 260,000 and 520,000. So that whole middle range is missing in the market. You can't find it. Um, 
another indicator that most, most much of what's been out there has been sold. Um, and the other significant thing to keep in mind, of course, is that vacancy rates for rentals in Vermont are really low. I don't have specific data for uh, Randolph, but just looking at listings, I can tell that it's very low in the community as well. Okay, Sarah. So here's what I think of as Randolph's assets that would can will attract development, will attract people first and then development. Um, Childcare capacity. Uh, there's a forthcoming project that will really solidify childcare in the community, and that um, has proven to be really significant for attracting employers and attracting people. Um, the presence of co-working space in the downtown, that's impressive for a small downtown to have co-working space. Um, and it's something that sort of uh, shows you that there's an uptick, uptick in activity in the community. The active arts community in, in Randolph is a real attractive item. Um, recreation, both within the community and um, within a, a short drive of the community. Um, the small town feel, local education, your kids, if, if you move here um, to Randolph as a family, your kids are educated locally. And of course, fiber-based internet is, is really critical. I think two other things that are really happening now, COVID has been happening and climate change has been happening, but they're going to have effects in Vermont. COVID in the short run very definitely has brought new households to the region. Um, the, the data isn't available yet, but every community I go to talks about new households that have moved in because they've had it with living in urban areas and they have looked to small town Vermont. Um, so that's that's there and you could call that a short-term impact, but COVID keeps running, it, it keeps going, and it looks like it's gonna be around for a while, it'll be part of our lives. The second one that, that really is, is maybe just beginning to register is climate change. Um, people who want to get away from constant flooding, from heat, from things like that, um, will begin to bring people to Vermont, a, a place that is relatively free of some of those. We're not free of climate change, but we're free at least relatively free of some of the, it's more extreme impacts. Um, I think the COVID thing has brought more affluent people to Vermont, people who could move very quickly. I think climate change will bring a more diverse group to Vermont, people who are um, just looking to get out of wherever they are right now. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, so let's look at the, the housing side of things. And this is um, this graphic shows a, you know, a graphic, and this would be very, very typical for most Vermont communities. The blue is the number, the blue bars are the numbers of households in certain age groups. Um, in currently, 2021, the red bars are comparing it to a five-year projection uh, in, for, in various age groups, that is 18 to 34, 35 to 54, 55 to 64 and 65 years plus. And what we see here is that the number of young households is, is expected to actually decrease by 14% in the next few years, next five years. Number of middle-aged, if you will, 35 to 54 year old households will increase slightly. That's a positive 3%. The number of um, sub-senior, if you will, 55 to 64, year old households will decrease. That's primarily because the baby boom is moving out of that age group, is aging out of that age group. And there'll be finally a dramatic increase in the number of households in um, 65 years or older in, in the market area around Randolph. And what's particularly, you know, what's interesting here is about Randolph is if you look at population figures, really isn't changed much in, in the past decade. Um, it's pretty much the same as it was in 2010. But what I always note and say to anybody in any community is look at new housing. And there has been minimal, if any, new housing development in Randolph in that period. Um, so it's kind of hard to move to or um, make a community bigger if housing opportunities aren't there. And right now they're, they're very limited. Go ahead, Sarah. 
Um, what's interesting, uh, this is very interesting to me, and it, it, I think it's really important to, sh to point out the imbalance of the housing stock versus the number of the households that live in a town. On the left-hand side, that pie chart breaks down Randolph area households by size. 26% of all Randolph households are just one person. 36% are just two people. So right there, 62% of all the households in the area have only one or two people. But then we look at, and, and this is breaking down all of the um, uh, housing units in Randolph by size. Um, only 3% are studios, 12% are one bedroom, 22, 21% are two bedroom. So that if you add that up, you'll see that about 35% of the housing units are two units or less. That compares to 62% of your households that are only one or two people. So there's a major imbalance between the size of the housing, housing units in the community. Um, and the actual household, households that live out there. You know, a household, no, a typical household in the U.S. is no longer mommy, daddy, and two kids. That's just not, that's the minority these days. And yet our housing stock is mostly built for that kind of household. So there's a real shortage of smaller housing units um, in, the, in the area. Okay, go ahead, Sarah. This is even a, maybe a, a little more deep, um, but if you look at it very carefully, what I've done is shown households by age and income in this graphic. Um, and if you know how old a household is and what their income is, you know a lot about what they're doing for housing. Um, and what this specifically shows in various, um, for various groupings is how those groups will change over the next five years. For instance, if you look at the upper left, you'll see that households that are aged from 30, 18 years to 35, 40 years, who are a very low income category, zero to 25,000, will decrease over the next five years. Whereas if you look at the other extreme, households that are 65 or more years and earn a, and incomes in excess of 100,000, that group will increase by 106 in the next five years. Um, what's also, and this is very basic data that I use to look at housing need. What's really important to understand about this is, well, the, the, uh, some groups are decreasing, some are increasing. The housing market is most influenced by younger and lower income households because they move frequently. Whereas older and higher income households move very, very infrequently, relatively speaking. Okay, go ahead, Sarah. Um, so then I wanted to look at some com the commercial side of things. What are some of the potentials in Randolph? The top part just, uh, just highlights some particular sectors that have shown growth in the Randolph area in the, in the last few years. That's construction, um, more activity there, financial activities, that's real estate, banking, those sorts of things professional and business services. That's professionals like engineers, um, people like me, um, people who legal, um, architecture, those kinds of folks. And then of course, what we can certainly expect in any community is that there's going to be long-term growth in healthcare. That's always a, a growth sector. And given an aging population, that will certainly be a, a, a health sector. And you know, Randolph has its foot strongly in the healthcare sector. So that's a positive. I also like to look at um, travel indicators. Um, and there's not actually, because Randolph's um, travel indicators are so small, there's not data available, but for Orange County, overall, there's been very little growth in the last decade. And yet there's been substantial growth in terms of short-term rentals. Um, VRBO, those sorts of things, that is growing. There is interest in travel, but the traditional forms of travel, hotels, bed and breakfast, really haven't grown in the area. I also made another comparison, and this is, again, a little bit uh, number focused, but I looked at meal sales, that is restaurant uh, revenues, 
in a number of areas, Vermont, Randolph, Bethel, Montpelier, Royalton, Waterbury, and compared them in terms of sales per capita. How much does a community bring in per resident? Randolph at $1,600 per resident isn't even as high as the average for all of Vermont. Um, what this in a nutshell tells me is Randolph's underperforming in this sector. Um, there's need for more restaurant, more food service, more drinking places, more entertainment places. Randolph is de definitely underserved in that area. Okay, Sarah, go ahead. Um, and other retail uh, opportunities. This is just a comparison of how much, what sales actually occur in the area versus the demand that's generated by the people who live in the area. And several of the areas that show opportunities are lawn and garden equipment, clothing, general merchandise, that is general store, depart, small department stores, specialty foods, and then, as I mentioned a moment ago, restaurants and drinking places. Okay, Sarah. Um, other commercial opportunities that I think are there is, you know, and I mentioned specifically bed and breakfast. I, I think a hotel would be great in Randolph, but I think at this point, the community doesn't quite have enough volume to support a, a full, full line hotel. So I think the better way to look at it is to build up with smaller entities like bed and breakfasts. Um, the next category may be something you've never thought of before, structured handyman services. Right now in, in this part of the world, you, you call somebody you know who can fix things and maybe they can come and usually they can't. Um, but in a lot of communities, people have sort of built up, you know, uh, come together and structured uh, co-op sort of services where you can actually call, get somebody to help you with fixing your sink putting some new clapboard on your housing, that sort of thing. Um, and that's particularly important in a community where there's an aging population. A couple of other things that pop up for Randolph are pet supplies and services and food trucks, um, a really good way for restauranters and, and um, people in that sector to test out a market and find out if it's a good place. Okay, Sarah. So um, on the residential side, here's, here's what my preliminary findings are. And I'm very interested in what I hear tonight because I'm going to go back and refine this afterward. But in terms on the rental side, there is very definitely demand uh, for rentals in, in three categories. And one would be subsidized rentals. That is for lower income folks. And that is a strong need throughout the state, certainly not um, you know, unique to Randolph at all. Um, there's a need for a, what I will call affordable or tax credit, credit rentals. These are units and they're, they're all over the state. There's some in Randolph already that have somewhat below market rate um, uh, rents, um, but really are in a great need for work, um, lower income working folks. And there's also a need for market rate rentals. Um, rentals that um, rent at the going market rate. And I think honestly, given the, the data I've got and what I can see is that there really is a demand for about 60 units over a two or three year period in, in Randolph. I also think, and I think this would be a second step that there's potential for ownership housing in Randolph. That is um, how smaller housing units that are oriented toward first time buyers or or senior buyers, folks 65 or older. These would be two bedroom units that might include workspace for people who do their own thing and want to work at home. Um, with, you know, in, I, I know this may be shocking, but starter housing now is in the 325 to 350 range. Um, and I think this is a potential that has maybe, um, there's potential for 15 or to 20 units over a three year period. Um, so in th those are the very quick run at what I've, I've come up with. And I think a lot of this could, are things that could fit on some of the sites we'll look at tonight. Thanks. Here we go, sorry. Thank you so much, Doug. We really appreciate your um, work on this presentation. I'm going to um go ahead and 
move us into, um, my apologies, I'm struggling to pull this up to the right slide, but I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, apologies, I'm still not on that one. Okay. Okay, so again, this is Sarah Wright from Two Rivers. The Randolph community has had many productive conversations around the future of the downtown before this evening. And we wanted just to take a moment to briefly recap some of the ideas that have come up repeatedly in the downtown meetings and in the Randolph region re-energized or R3 process. Um, and we're not gonna try to summarize all of the conversation that's happened before this evening, because that would be impossible and we are uh, very short on time, but we thought that some bullet points might be helpful to jog everybody's memory. So I've put down a list here um, of some of the more commonly discussed potential uses that uh, the community identified as needs in downtown. Um, and as we heard from um, Doug just now, a number of those community identified needs sort of overlap with his analyses of market opportunities. And I've highlighted those in red here. Also, because we're going to be discussing um, site design this evening, we've picked out some of the recurring comments about the downtown streetscape that go beyond uses. Um, so community members have highlighted that they'd like to see the downtown be ADA accessible, more pedestrian friendly. Um, that means with sidewalks and other amenities, but also sort of street facing businesses, uh, more bike friendly, wayfi wayfinding signage, uh, mixed use developments, public Wi-Fi, street beautification, uh, more cohesiveness of the aesthetics of the streetscape and electric vehicle charging stations, also connectivity to trails. So, from there, I'm going to pass it to Kevin, who's going to lead us through a brief question and answers period. Okay, so um, we're running a few minutes, maybe five minutes or so behind, not, not too bad. Uh, if there are any burning questions, or, uh, and maybe we can get answers from just a couple people on what you've seen so far, if it's a question about, oh, what about that site, or all those things, that's the next part coming up. So if anything's about questions and really uses on sites, or comments on that area, that's really the next part of the discussion. Um, but if there's any questions uh, right now, and if anybody wants to raise their hand, I see Gary's hand, so I'm gonna call on Gary. Gary, you wanna unmute yourself there, Gary Durer. Gary, you gotta unmute yourself there. Gary, can you unmute yourself? I was go. very impressed with Doug Kenny's uh, analysis of the Randolph area. Uh, but one of the things he said was that uh, there was a need for more B and Bs and not so much hotel. Well, there was a study done during our three three years ago that said that there was a hole along 89 for a hotel and uh, it is planned to be built next year so uh, did your study include the that uh, hotel on 89 doug i'm i'm definitely aware of that pro uh that project um i guess it, as as i went through my analysis i was really more focused on thinking about the downtown um and yeah, that, that project um, may go forward. And that's going to, if, if, if it does occur, it's more oriented toward, it's a very big part of that will be travel along 89, um, as opposed to a hotel that's specifically focused in the community. Um, I'm not, certainly not saying there isn't a demand. I think in the short run, being realistic and having worked with a lot of um, lodging properties, it would be difficult to find fi financing for a hotel project in downtown Randolph. Yeah, well, the study that was done in R3 basically said b, &B downtowns and a hotel on 89. Okay, yeah, so I concur. There Good. we go, that's the answer. Right. Thank you, Doug. Uh, any other questions or so? Uh, you can wave your hand or you can use the little hand symbol down under uh, reactions. 
And if not, we will move on to the next part. I'm not Adam, we, have, we have a question from John oh. Kaplan. Hey, John. Yep. Yep. Hi. Um, and maybe this is what you're about to get into, but I was a little confused by the all the parcels that were highlighted on that first map, like the four four areas. Um, you know, Branchwood is pretty obvious as a site that is kind of there to be developed, but um, maybe are you going to talk? I guess I'm I'm a little unclear about the status of the other parcels and why they were included. Yeah, I, I think um, we're actually going to talk about that some coming up, but if Sarah or maybe uh, Josh wants to hit that. Sarah, do you want to? Sure. So these parcels were selected in consultation with the town um, with input from RACDC as well. Um, and they were identified as a subset of the parcels that have significant redevelopment potential are either vacant currently or have significant redevelopment potential. And the town has been thinking about it collectively um, in those specific areas for a while. And so we recognize that these particular parcels are not um, all of the parcels that need attention in the downtown. They were simply highlighted because we have to start somewhere. Um, and so these were sort of picked out as ones where we could focus community dialogue and attention um, for the purposes of this study, recognizing that obviously there will be conversations about many other portions of the downtown as well. So the, the, um, the sites are quite diverse and um, in their histories and in their current statuses as well. So I hope, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, basically, I guess, if I, unless I misread the map, isn't, are you showing one of the parcels as the Playhouse Theater? That's, that was the one that kind of caught my eye the most. Yes, that was, that was selected in consultation with the town. Um, I guess and again, I, that one, that one just is a little bit of a head scratcher for me, but that's okay. Would anybody from the town um, or Julie, would you like to, to speak to that particular parcel? And, and if not, we can, you know, we're going to go around and, and kind of work on these parcels. And so maybe that can come up in that discussion too. I do see yeah. one more hand and, and then let's go to the uh, next part. And that's from Mark Kelly. So Mark, can you unmute? Okay. Yeah, um, in Doug's presentation, there was a, toward the end, there was a histogram that talked about the uh, different opportunities um, for gray bars with some numbers at the top, which were dollar figures, and I would ask if he would explain that a little bit better. So Doug, can you um, bring us back there? I think I'm, uh, can you, Sarah, can you get us back to that? Yeah, I'm trying, my apologies. Um, okay. And I, I missed the description of, of which figure it is, I'm sorry. Is it this uh, one? No, keep going, I think one more. I think it's a, this one. Okay. Is is this the one you're talking about? Yes, it is. It is okay. This is a very. This is um, uh, what I do is calculate total sales in each retail c category. Um, in other words, existing sales that existing businesses are generating, and um, you know I don't know it to the dollar, but we can. Um, estimate it pretty closely. And then we compare it with the demand that is generated by people living in the region. Okay, um, How much do they spend on restaurants? How much do they spend on clothing? That sort of thing. Um, and when you compare those two numbers, you certain things start to pop out, such as, gosh, there's much more demand for in this sense, let's say clothing, um, uh, much more demand generated by people in the region than there is actual sales in that category. Um, and that's, boy, that's very typical for small downtowns because an awful lot of clothing shopping occurs in, you know, either, well, it used to be malls, 
Uh, now it's a lot of it's on the internet, um, but a lot of it doesn't occur in, in a downtown area. But what this does show to me, and this, that's what this very simply shows, is where there are areas where there are, there's clearly more demand generated in the area than there is supply in, in Randolph itself. And, and, and this is just a way of identifying opportunities um, that people, that entrepreneur, entrepreneurs might jump into because that maybe they can capture part of that demand, part of that demand that's now going somewhere else. Does that make Very, sense? Well, almost. Um, what are the numbers across the top? Uh, the, for lawn and guard equipment, it's 1.1 million surplus clothing, $10.4 million surplus. These are general, surpluses. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Surplus of demand over actual sales. So they could be thought of as the gap in, in available. It, this is this is called gap analysis. Yes, correct. Yep. Great. Um, so now Sarah's going to have the ball uh, for the next the next hour or so, which is going to be in two parts. So Sarah, if you while I'm talking, you can get ready to do whatever you're going to do over there. And uh, so we're going to be looking again out of those blocks, um, the south, the central, and the northern stuff. And she is also going to uh, give you over in the chat. I believe she's going to paste a link for a Google document where. Um, if you don't want to comment right now, or if you're you know, not the type of person who just jumps in on Zoom, you can be putting stuff over in this Google document and we can watch that. And uh, we will leave that open uh, for the rest of the evening and then we will shut it down um, just so it doesn't go on and on. And so we can be looking at that. And so there's a link over there in the chat I can see for folks. And, and this is about focusing we've got a, a scatter shot of several places how how do you want us to focus down on a particular thing and then um what kind of uses do you want us to focus uh, on those particular places so sarah are you ready to take the ball okay thank you okay um so i'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so we can do um Is that full screen now, Kevin, do you see it full screen? Okay, fantastic. So as Kevin mentioned, we're now transitioning into the portion of this evening's conversation where we're really looking for your input um, and all of the comments that you make this evening and that you post in the Google document, uh, which is linked in the chat. Um, and please, if you're having trouble accessing the Google document, raise your hand, let us know. Um, you should have editing permission there, so you can go ahead and type things in. We're going to go through each block one by one, and we're going to talk through, first of all, the potential uses that you see as being um, possibilities there. Um, and then we're going to think about which block might be good to, to pick one site out of to do a more deep dive into from a design point of view. And we're gonna ask for some design guidance from you on that. And then we're gonna to transition to talking about Branchwood and we'll talk about uses and we'll also talk about um, site design for that. Um, and so as we go through, I'm gonna give a little bit of introduction bef before we dive in, but I do wanna say, just sort of thinking back to the comment about the Playhouse Theater, when we're talking about uses and, and potential redevelopment, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case that a use might change on a parcel, but redevelopment might look like changing the, um, the look of the parcel or maybe the design of part of the parcel um, so that it matches the other buildings and sort of achieves that aesthetic consistency that folks have been talking about um, or something to that effect, right? So it doesn't necessarily uh, follow that a use has to change during redevelopment. Um, but it's, it's something that we want to talk about this evening and get, and get your input on. So let's dive in here to the West Block, which again is um, a series of parcels over on the Western end of Western Street near the intersection with School Street, sort of flanking the uh, railroad corridor there. Um, 
And I do want to make a note that the zoning here is gateway commercial. So that uh, according to the current land use regulations, the, the only prohibited use for this area is indoor retail. Um, and the zoning district does specify a maximum lot coverage of 70%, and the minimum setbacks are fairly large. It's 20 feet for the side and the rear and 50 feet for the front. It's worth noting that the distance between the railroad easement and Weston Street is only 40 feet. So, um, you know, redeveloping this thin strip of land between the railroad and Weston Street is challenging from just a physical standpoint, but also um, from a regulatory standpoint as well. So that said, um, you know, this diagram does, we've tried to mark a couple of um, important landmarks surrounding the blocks. You can get a sense and really think about, you know, how does this, how do these parcels relate to the surrounding development, to the surrounding area um, and the natural resources as well, because obviously this is, um, there's, there's more undeveloped land uh, to the south of this block. So given the surrounding context of this block, um, what kinds of land uses do you think would be appropriate and successful in this block, in this area? So if you have thoughts you'd like to share, please go ahead and raise your hand. And again, you can enter it into the Google Doc as well. Je I see uh, Jeffrey Grout. Yeah, can I just chime in or? Please, yes, please do. Yeah, I'm just, um, I don't know if this would meet the zoning requirements, but I just, looking at the picture, it's got close proximity to a lot of trails that are up on the hill behind it. And um, I know there's a lot of trail development. That's, I think, a big draw toward Randolph that's going to get larger is the mountain bike trails. Would that be possible? I don't know, for some type of um, uh, park area or camping recreational area, staging area for mountain bike or trail walks there. I, and again, I'm just thinking out loud, so I don't know if that would make sense, but. Um, this is a fine time to think out loud. Yeah, just brainstorming, I guess. But that's the first thing that jumped out at me is it's um, very close proximity to a lot of trails. I don't know what we can do with the buildings right beside the railroad tracks. They've been there a while, and I guess I'd call those pretty heavy industrial buildings. Um, now, I love what they did to old mills in some towns where they make breweries out of buildings like that, but <laughs> that close to the railroad tracks, I don't know what would happen, but I'll throw that in. A, 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 Mountain bike or trail recreation area and a brewery. Thank you. And I don't know if that fits um, zoning or not, but it's okay. And I see Josie oh, Crothers. Yep. So, Josie, you're on mute, Josie. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I how I, I'm not sure in what condition those buildings are in and if they are redevelopable, um, um, but um, it certainly uh, it seems like a light manufacturing use. But also um, interesting for artist studios if those buildings are usable at all. Um, I think they're you know tying in with the, with the art scene. Um, it's something that that would possibly need subsidizing um, it, it, to uh, to redevelop those buildings into a you know a, a use like that that's not that's not profit driven. So um, uh, I just don't know to what extent those buildings are an asset or not. Um, this is in contrast to Jeff Grout's comments about the trails. It's a two very conflicting uses there, um, but um, it's a large area and would be, could be really good for continued industrial use in a, in a light way. So. Thank you. I see a hand from Kate Branstetter. 
Hey. <laughs> Uh, let me see if I can do video here. Um, I just want to, can everybody see me? Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi. So um, I'm part of the uh, library as well as I'm a business owner in town. And one of the things that we are really, really finding, we just did this huge uh, question assessment with um, people in the community and parents. And one of the things that I just want to point out is that there is a huge need we're finding for space um, for people to have meetings outside with the pandemic and all that is happening. Um, people are constantly looking for places like a table that's undercover um, all the time. And with the library closed, it's something that we offered over the summer, but now we're not because we took our tent down. The other thing is um, places for teens to hang out. We have no central place for sort of an older, not childcare, but an older sort of population of youth in town. There's no place. So um, just throwing that out there. I don't know about zoning with the railroads and everything, but just keep in mind that there is a huge need for both of those things. Thank you very much. <laughs> I see a hand from John. Yep. Um, so if I understand right, you're basically saying like our current zoning makes the parcels on the railroad track side almost you couldn't meet zoning essentially and have the setbacks and whatnot is what I heard you say. Um, so I'll just this is maybe kind of a bold. <laughs> I would say on the sort of track side, you know, I know those buildings have some historic value, but honestly they're kind of an eyesore that whole strip of old industrial kind of railroad oriented buildings i'd say on the railroad side take them all down make it some kind of green space we have very little green space in the downtown um and then i like jeff's idea on the other side or you know we just heard you know in doug's presentation a lot about sort of smaller housing needs. What about a whole row of, we call it the railroad condos on the other side of the street? Um, dense development within a walking distance of the downtown. You know, maybe that would drive sidewalk development along Weston Street, which is sorely needed. Um, so that's, that's my thought. Um. I do want to keep us moving along so that we can get through everything we need to get to this evening. I don't see any other hands raised at the moment. Um, of see. course, you can continue entering uh, comments into the Google document. Kevin? I see uh, Nate. Yes, uh, thank you, everyone. I actually have to uh, sign off to go do some uh, bedtimes here. But uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that I really appreciate your time. This was an excellent and informative presentation. Doug, thank you very much. I think uh, I have personally witnessed a lot of what you said in your presentation. So, you know, thank you for bringing that to the attention of the uh, larger audience here. And um, it's nice to see some familiar faces here. And, uh, you know, I'm excited that um, we have a lot of passionate residents here in town. So uh, thank you. I did leave a few comments in the Google Doc and um, thank you. And I unfortunately I have to sign off here. So take thank care. You. Thank okay. you very much. We, we yeah. do have the other areas uh, to cover too, and the Branchwood. So, Sarah, you're going to go to that. Okay. So, the next area that we'd like to talk to you about and get your input on potential uses is the central block. We've outlined um, the parcels of interest in red. And I do want to just a quick note on zoning. This is the central business district, which supports sort of dense, multi story, customer oriented businesses and services. As the land use regulations currently stand, um, the following uses would be prohibited. Contractor yards, single and two family residential, heavy industry and rural industrial uses. Um, and the sort of dimensional specifications for this district do allow quite dense development, a maximum lot coverage of 100%, very small setbacks, zero to, to 10 feet. Um, so you can pack quite a lot in here. I will also note that at the 2013 downtown meeting, um, there, the following comments were made about this particular area. There was a call for sort of landscaping and greening up of the streetscape. 
Um, there was a suggestion of maybe an art corridor or gardens along L Street. Um, there was a call for more aesthetically consistent uh, streetscapes in this area and a call for sidewalks, of course, for pedestrian connectivity along Weston Street. Um, and there was also talk about artist studios and living spaces on Weston Street, which we talked a little bit about um, in the West Block discussion as well. So for that, I'd like to open up the discussion again. What kinds of uses do you see as being possible and appropriate for this particular area? I see a hand from Josie. Uh, very, very quickly, um, a uh, somebody who uh, former uh, member of the select board um, was upstairs in the space uh, above the is I think it's the Napa Auto Parts store, the one near the movie theater, and um, it's fantastic space up there, um, and um, could be really good rentals. Um, and I think in, in a lot, lot of the buildings in downtown um, could become rental residential. Uh, Gary, I see your hand, Gary. You're muted, Gary. I've, I've always been intrigued by the possibility of clothing slash shoe stores in downtown Randolph. Now I know we're up against West Lebanon, but personally, I'd go downtown to get some shoes and clothes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments? And while we're while folks are thinking, I will remind you that if you're entering comments into the Google document, the um, comments for Central Block will be on the second page, I believe. It'll, it's sort of organized by page. Okay, I see Jamaica. Hi, um, I just wanted to go off of what my mom Josie was saying, but uh, so first I wanna say that affordable rentals and, and nice quality rentals should be paramount. But um, another thing to think about is the building with Napa is um, could be a boutique hotel and, and bring tourism to downtown. I've been um, studying small towns and how they have regenerated themselves or sort of come back from the brink of ghost towns for the last couple of years. And um, I have found some really amazing tiny little boutique hotels that have revitalize some really tiny towns, a lot smaller than Randolph. Um, so not necessarily there, but in one of the older buildings um, downtown, it's, you know, I've seen, I've seen boutique hotels with just a couple of rooms that have really made a difference in some of the towns. So it's just something to, to keep on the back burner if any of these properties end up you know, being potential for tourism, that, you know, that would be a, a good way to bring more businesses downtown. Thank you. I see a, Kate, a hand from Kate Branstetter. This is the last thing I'm going to say, I promise. Um, so one of the things I want I just want to say two things. I definitely agree about housing. We really, really, really need housing. Um, I have lots of friends that want to move to the area, especially out of like Brooklyn, but can't find housing. And the other thing is that when we asked um, all the teenagers <laughs> and getting ready to graduate kids at Randolph, we asked them, you know, what would you need in order to stay and live here? And many, 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 the majority said an outdoors and fishing shop. Ooh. So someplace that caters to um, outdoor recreation, but on like a level of stuff. So just throwing that out there. And now I'm going to be quiet. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. On the subject of a boutique hotel, as we all know, there's a railroad that goes right through downtown. And I would think there'd be some passengers who would need, uh, enjoy being able to just spend the night there. And that would uh, be an asset towards, you know, you know, having more restaurants, which um, it was stated that we need. 
Thanks. Thank you. Um, if, if I can jump in, just going on uh, what Gary said, don't forget about Amtrak and the train that comes right directly to Randolph. And I think that goes directly to New York City. And uh, if we could promote that and, um, you know, spiffy up downtown area a little bit, that could, it really could be a real attraction. And especially right, get right down into a small town with all the outdoor recreation that we, you know, that are available. Um, yeah, I think we should promote, that's something that could be promoted for sure. So yeah, that goes, but I think that's a great idea. That, I love that boutique hotel idea. Even if it's a relatively small unit, you could probably keep it full most of the time. So that sounds like a real opportunity as well. And that's what we want to do is attract the business to downtown first, I think. So. Thank you. So at this point, I think maybe I'd like to move on to the north block, unless you see additional hands, Kevin. I, I do, um, but we okay. do have, we do need to get to Branchford at the end. And okay. so um, how are you yep. feeling for time? Yeah, so let's, let's move along. And again, please enter your comments into the Google document. Type, type directly in there. Um, we, we definitely want to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to the North Block, which is also zoned commercial business district. So again, that sort of high density friendly um, zoning that we've already talked about for the Central Block. At the 2013 downtown meeting, it was mentioned, um, there, there was some talk of activating Pleasant Street. Um, along here as sort of a second main street. And the idea was to have perhaps back entrances to the stores that are fronting on main street. There was also talk of landscaping and murals, better pedestrian amenities, trail connectivity. Um, and there was also discussion of potentially putting in a new food store in the Pleasant Street area. So with that said, um, and looking at the surrounding context for these two um, parcels that are highlighted in red here. What are some, some uses that you, you would like to see come into that area? I see Josie's hand. Josie. Uh, a few years back, um, there in the uh, red square between the Gre the Gear House and Randolph House, um, uh, there was extensive talk about a, a downtown park there, and and Vermont Tech students uh, submitted models uh, that <clears throat> I think were on display at the library. Anyway, um, a lot of really creative ideas. The thing about that is that it is, it's a, it's a uh, you can almost fall into it. It's a it's a wonderful downhill, um, uh, and, and so it's a, it's very intriguing um, in that way. And as opposed to what could be a good idea, having uh, open space out Salisbury Street, um, this is really in the visible downtown and um, would be um, a major asset. Uh, in that way, it's the most viable spot for an interesting park uh, currently potentially available. I think there's a old house or two that need, that's been condemned on that property. Thank you, Joseph. Other thoughts and comments? Zach? All right, thank you. Um, I too need to jump in just a second for bedtime here with the little guy, but um, I just wanted to add in a couple of things back when um, there was a lot of talk about recreation. Uh, I just wanted to let folks know that the SE group did a, a community impact study um, on the tail end of the Vorek grant that the town won back in 2019. And um, we put a trail counter at the Ellis Town Forest trailhead and we put it in for th this past summer from uh, June, July, August, and I think into the beginning of September. And the, um, the trail use numbers there and uh, 
I don't have the report right in front of me, but it was uh, over 12,000 uh, trail users over the summer that use the Ellis Town Forest Trailhead. Um, so that kind of gives you a snapshot of users. That's that's both hikers, that's everybody, trail runners, mountain bikers, hikers, um, and and all of that. So I think you can get a good sense right from from that right there uh, that that there's a, um, a very strong growth rate um, even from just a few years ago when there was no trails at all in the Ellistown Forest, and that's just one teeny little section of the larger randolph area trail network um the gear house there that that land and property we did have some larger plans for out back of that building uh pre-covid uh covid kind of put the clamps on some of our other um longer range plans with kind of entertainment ideas and food truck ideas in the back of the uh the gear house but um i will let I don't know if if Josh Jerome, uh, if Josh feels like um, the town just applied for an, um, another Vorak grant, and I won't let the cat out of the bag. I'll let him um, kind of speak to that if he sees fit. But uh, the idea um, of what's in that Vorak grant kind of falls a little bit in line with um, what's been discussed here tonight. Some exciting ideas around housing and, and recreation and combining those. So I'll, I'll defer to Josh on that. I, I, I want to say something, but I, I don't think I should. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, all great ideas. Um, the buildings next door, I think would be a great place to have a boutique hotel to tear down those buildings um, and, uh, and rebuild those. Uh, it's a great visible spot on Main Street. And I, fully support that so thank you guys for thank everything. you john you have your hand raised john Kaplan. yep um i i'm glad josie brought up the park idea because um i think there were some really creative designs um that would definitely you know kind of enhance the downtown um kind of alternatively you know i that seems like a spot where you could have some you know, two to three story buildings that were, or maybe a single building that had some kind of like office, you know, small business or a retail on the ground floor and then some, you know, apartments above it. Um, Cause again, right in the downtown and, um, but I probably given those two things, I, I, you know, I, I feel like some more green space in downtown would be good. Any other hands that you see, Kevin? I'm not no, I'm not. Uh, I, I see Gary? Gary again, and and we're getting down to about the last half hour, so we'll probably need yeah. to go to Brentford mm -hmm. soon. So, Gary, do you have a short one? Gary, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, you this is relative to that comment on the need for uh, green space. Whatever happened to that property? on Pleasant Street, uh, just on the corner behind it is Canamot Solar. What's the status of that? I don't I don't know. Um, do we have an answer that, that we can give Gary very, very briefly on that? Or is it something we can follow up on, Josh, maybe? Um, I, I, I guess I don't know what, what Parcel you're talking about, Gary. Um, this is the, the pocket park on the corner. Yeah. Um, Julie may be able to help us if she's on the line. Right. I mean, I think I think that that project is is not has not gone forward or has not had any momentum for a few years now. So I think it's not really a, a thing. I think that was um, a project that back when it was being proposed had a lot of public support, but the town didn't really follow up on it sufficiently. Uh, yeah, this is, I don't know this for a fact, but I had heard that there was kind of, because the parcel is owned by, I believe it's owned by the Catamount Solar or whoever owns that property and, and that they couldn't work out kind of a agreement 
about liability if it was publicly used or something like that. Right. The yeah. cat mouse solar was willing to get something worked out. Yeah, they were basically willing to give the property to the town, was my understanding. But there was some legal issue. All right. Well, we're going to take note of that. And again, uh, as Sarah said, there's the um, that Google link in the chat. So if if you're a quiet person or something's just, uh, you know, we move past you and you want to keep stuff, put stuff in there and we'll, we'll grab it and we'll be looking at that later. So um, are we going now to over to Branchwood, Sarah? So before we do that, um, I did want to get feedback on one piece. So as part of this area-wide study, we're going to be do with VHB's very kind assistance, there's going to be conceptual designs developed for two specific sites, two specific parcels. Um, and so we would like your feedback on which of the blocks that we've discussed so far, the Western, the Northern, the Central, would be good to pick a catalyst site out from. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is um, I'm going to put up a poll um, and I'm gonna ask everybody to go ahead and please respond. Um, it, just tell me whether you think you know, a catalyst site should be picked from the West Block, the Central Block, the North Block, based on your own personal interest, what you've heard this evening, what you think the most potential is for coming up with an interesting design. Let's see, we have 33 people here, so something like so 30 we're seconds. At 19 people so far. Okay, hurry up and vote. We're going to leave it open for another 30 seconds and then we're going to go ahead and close it. Okay, All right. we are at 20 respondents um, so far. So the, or 21, thank you for the person who just jumped in. So I am gonna go ahead and close this poll right now. And, and right now it's looking like um, the central block came in with the most number of votes. Can everybody see the results from the poll then? Great, I see some nodding heads, fantastic. So it looks like central block is of greatest interest to folks. So that's where we'll go ahead and pick a catalyst site from. Um, if you have ideas for which uh, parcel in particular would be good from the ones that we've highlighted um, here, I'm gonna stop sharing this. And I'm going to uh, actually just jump back to central block. If you have an idea of which of these particular parcels would be good for us to do some conceptual designs around, that means a rough site map and some renderings of streetscapes, um, that please do let us know. Drop it into the Google document there under the central block section um, and let us know which site you'd like to see worked on. Um, but from there, I'm going to ask us to transition our thinking to um, the east block, which is the Branchwood site. And you can see it here. Um, I've included, you can see the central, central block sort of peeking in in your, your lower left-hand corner here of the map, but the, the property that we're focusing on right now is just the Branchwood site, um, which straddles both sides of Pearl Street and is currently vacant um, in its entirety, with the exception of the, the one smokestack. Um, so I wanted to start off by asking for input on what uses would be desirable, appropriate, successful for the Branchwood site? And I do see a hand from Haiti. Apologies if I said your name incorrectly. It's Heidi. It's all good. Heidi. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Heidi, and I am the recreation director for the town. And so I'm going to um, advocate for our youth and our seniors, as well as for our community. Um, you know, for through the rec department, 
We have over 800 users that use our facilities um, for youth sports, camps, pool, ice rink, um, as well as our special events that we have in town that we have created in the last four years. Um, and the, big, the biggest takeaway from our youth, um, as Kate um, talked about a little bit, is um, there is no place for our youth, our middle school youth and our older youth. Uh, big advocate for biking and mountain biking, um, but that is also a high-end sport. The youth that I work with, over 200, 300 kids, can't afford bikes. Um, and, and then when they want a bike at camp, the number one thing they want to bike is in a skate park. Um, that is a huge need in our community in central Vermont. Um, it's a big thing for our youth. Um, and we can't forget about them. And I feel like we're constantly forgetting about them and putting them to the side somewhere that we can't see. Um, in my experience for 20 years in recreation, when you put something in the middle of town, like a skate park or a park for older kids, senior activity that we have a walk space, um, it's get used because you got a large, large community watching over our youth as well as our seniors. Um, we also don't have a town green either for our events. We have some of the largest Halloween events, um, winter events that we created, 4th of July, are very popular here in Randolph that bring lots of people to town. Um, and we have to close down some streets and all that stuff that you know cause traffic jams and all that good stuff. If we have a community space that we could include food trucks, um, a green that we can have large events for our community, that's an ideal spot for that as well. Um, and our seniors, we have um, our Randolph house, we have the Red Lions, we also have um, Jocelyn house, and they don't have a space to walk around our downtown. Um, for their health um, and for their mental health, there also can be a nice walk path around the parcel. Um, and when you engage your seniors as well with youth together, it's, it brings the community together. It's, you have countless of data proving that, that um, that's what a community needs. Um, so I'm always, and then a dog park. Um, so in the last four years that I've been director, um, these are some of the highest needs that have come to our committee meetings it is a dog park, skate parks, Another playground, um, the current playground that is located at the rec area is for zero to five-year-olds. So an older kid above five or six-year-old, they get bored because it's very catered to zero to five. Um, and a community space event for our community that to gather. So those are the top things that we've been constantly um, bombarded with. Um, and that is the ideal spot that we have been talking about for four years that would really bring our community together. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Other comments about the Branchwood site, potential uses for the branch, reuses for the Branchwood site. And I'm seeing comments in the chat too, and we're capturing that, of course. So especially anybody who hasn't spoken already or interested in getting your comments. Pat, I see Pat. Um, I'd like to ask Doug Kennedy or maybe somebody else on Branchwood, what are the obstacles to housing with the railroad right nearby? in terms of noise and so forth. I heard a little bit of earlier talk about that, but not really explained. So I can, I can say a few words about that. The, the restriction really comes if there's a desire to have HUD funding um, for the project. So it's, it's certainly possible that a reuse could be accomplished without using HUD funding and therefore the regulatory constraints around noise um, wouldn't be as big of an issue. I think that the, 
the community should evaluate whether the noise levels, um, even outside of the regulatory context, if, if you feel comfortable with the noise le levels uh, in proximity to the railroad. I know that, you know, some folks, Josh was telling me that some folks live next to the railroad now. And so maybe getting a sense from the communities to, um, you know, how intense those noise levels really are, if that would work for the reuses that are being contemplated in that particular area. Just to add to that, I, the, the limitations because of noise were, and Sarah's um, conversation was specifically oriented toward projects that receive federal funding. Uh, in other words, a, if a private developer came in and um, did this and financed it private, financed something privately, um, there would be no limitation because of the noise, other than that developer would want to consider what impact the noise would have on what he he or she was trying to do. Um, you know, would would the noise be so much that it would be an unpleasant place to live? That's a good question. Um, but that the limitation because of the noise is only on things that are federally financed. It's not on um, privately financed projects. So um, it's, it's different ways of looking at that. So just to follow up, if that was being used for recreation, like which has been talked about, uh, would that be hard to find funding because of the probably use federal funds? So or again, it, it would rely on whether or not we're talking about HUD funding. It's possible right. that other federal agencies might not have the same restrictions. Let me chime in again. I actually live on Pearl Street. I live right next to the train tracks. The highest trains are coming in the middle of the night at 11 o'clock, two or three in the morning, and your house shakes a lot. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Luckily, I'm a city girl, so it doesn't really bother me, but it doesn't come in during the day. So the trains come at seven in the morning, 11 in the morning, and then it comes at seven o'clock at night, and several come throughout the middle of the night. You know, a couple times a week. So my neighbors can testify to that as well. But um, most of the activity is because. No, Heidi, so sorry. I think you got muted. No. Can you? Can so you the last thing I said was the highest activity is from about 11 to about seven o'clock in the morning. Okay, thank you. I do want to call on Mark Kelly, who's had his hand up for a little bit. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking that an overlapping use for for this, if it is um, set up as a uh, kind of a park, uh, is is of course the farmers market, which uh, really needs a place to settle, and could be done with uh, uh, the addition of an outdoor shelter, so that we'll have uh, spaces for people to to meet outdoors that have some shelter and uh, uh, you know, later on when, when COVID is over, if it is ever over, uh, th that space would be useful for people having picnics and that sort of stuff. Thank you, Mark. Um, so because we are getting close to the end of our time here, I do wanna remind folks, please drop your comments into the East Block section of the Google document. I would like to get your thoughts and feedback on how the site might be laid out. I'm hearing a lot about sort of open air uses of the site. Um, so, you know, as, as you're thinking about design of the site, where do you anticipate that people are going, that like the most activity is going to be concentrated? Where are most people gonna be gathering? Is it gonna be closer to the main, the sort of the Pleasant Street side of the parcel? Would it be elsewhere? Where are you envisioning sort of concentrations of people and then also structures if you're envisioning structures? Um, how, how are people gonna be moving through the space? We'd love to get your thoughts on that. I see Jamaica. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at this, I have two, two comments, but one is the SAP is, is right there. And I'm wondering if it would be possible to have, um, like a walkway through the woods up to there. Cause that's also where the, um, the fiber, I, 
So yeah, the fiber arts, um, I can't remember. Whole yeah, that whole complex um, is up there. So having a walkway through the woods might be a really nice thing, but also uh, public bathrooms for to, to facilitate, um, you know, outdoor. all of the outdoor activities that we we're talking about. Um, and especially, you know, just so that people can stay and enjoy themselves longer and not have to find a place in town to use their bathroom, but just to be able to really settle in for a good day in the park. Patrick French, your hand is up. Are you still interested in making a comment or was that from earlier? I already made my question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll lower your hand. Um, so Heidi, do you have another comment? Uh, yes. Um, I envision to uh, keep that smoke shack alive. It's kind of a memorial there to our town. Uh, so I do envision um, a nice, uh, you know, the park space kind of around that area um, to, to, you know, to highlight the smoke shack um, and one side to have, you know, if there is housing, that's good, uh, but also a dog park. And then the other side, um, the skate park towards Pleasant, you know, there's enough for parking as well that we do need in downtown, um, you know, as well as some space there near the park for, you know, food trucks, you know, a nice little gathering there. Um, A lot of communities have those walking paths that go completely around and you can also have some working workout stations and all that for you know keeping these seniors and other people you know healthy um and i like again the dog park that street i get we get i don't know 50 people walking by with their dogs on a daily basis <laughs> so it's a very popular you know route around our downtown there um, so I do, do see that that is a, a big need there. So, and, you know, parking. So thank you. That chimney could provide the best barbecue in the state. That is true. It's a great, great thing. Uh, I have a question for Josh, maybe this is Julie. Um, what will happen to the property on which the, uh, the Pearl Street well is located when that's closed down. Um, I, I mean, I think the town will retain ownership of that um, in case that well needs to be used um, again. Cool. I, I see Larry has his hand up. He hasn't spoken yet either. Yeah, I just thought I'd respond to that question from Julia that the Pearl Street well, the plan for the Pearl Street well right now is that once the new wells are online, um, the Pearl Street well will be entirely or mostly taken offline. And if it is taken entirely offline, it'll be still serviceable that it'll be used um, if, if we need to do work on the other wells or if there's some sort of emergency where we need additional water, but we will retain access to that site um, for the foreseeable future. Okay, thanks. So it would still be kind of a restricted area around it as well. I would assume so, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. Sure. Other comments on site layout for the Branchwood, future Branchwood redevelopment, whatever you envision that to be. Any comments about what you would like the, the streetscape to look like? So if, for example, there were pedestrian sidewalks um, sort of running along Pearl, what would you like that, what would you like a, a, a walker to be able to see as they're making their way west or east?
Ram Ramsey. Um, I know there was lots of controversy about it. Well, maybe not a lot of controversy. I think a lot of people liked it too, but the redesign of Merchant's Row, um, I think made such a huge difference um, already in the downtown. And I think um, continuing on with that kind of idea with the with the rain, um, what are they called? Uh, when you do the flower things to, to mitigate the rain, wastewater, I can't think what it's called, rain garden or something. Um, you know, that kind of idea, it just made so much of a, I guess we're still yet to see how it, how we deal with it with the snow, which was a lot of people's complaints with plows going through there. But I really think it's made a huge difference in on that little corner. And I'd love to see more of that around town and, and probably in the Branchwood area if that were to become a park or whatever it was to become. I think more of that I totally agree with everything John's saying about um, making the town more walkable. Uh, we have a lot of elderly people in Randolph and they need to have somewhere to go. They need to have something to do. You know, lots of places people go walk around malls or wh wherever when they wanna walk. Um, and there's nothing, there's no place to do that here safely for um, elderly people. So having nice sidewalks and, and all of that um, I think would be a great thing to do. Thank you. Comments. Transition. We'll spend one more minute on this and we'll transition to closing up. So lots of comments in the Google Doc. Thank you, everyone. Keep adding them. And this, this Google Doc map will be available through the rest of the evening. So if something strikes you after the meeting, please go ahead and uh, add your thoughts. Okay, I'm not seeing any more hands. Kevin, are you? Uh, I'm not. So we could do the kind of what's going on next part of life. Sounds good. Um, so Kevin, do you want to take it away? Yeah, so uh, just to, to give you an idea of, of what we're going to do with all this stuff, this is not the, the end of things. Um, so VHB is going to go off and they're going to work on some conceptual plans for uh, the Branchwood site and for um, the uh, site over there in that central area now. And we're going to have a second public meeting where we're going to show you all those things. Uh, we're not going to have a third public meeting afterwards, uh, but we're gonna, we are going to have a second public meeting, get some feedback on that and we'll produce, um, we'll get the final report um, from Kennedy there and that'll come into this. And then we'll also get a, a final um, kind of uh, report that's a synopsis of the overall environmental constraints as well that uh, the folks from VHB talked about there. A, um, that's the immediate next part of the, what's going to go on here. And I think uh, Josh is going to have a little bit of closing words to take us out. But I thank yeah. you all for coming tonight. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, and I and I think, yeah, just to just to sort of close out, uh, this has been really important to for uh, for participants to give us feedback um, on these really critical sites around the downtown. Um, and, you know, I think we, we really look forward to compiling this and seeing what the final product is going to be, um, which will help us inform, um, you know, actions that we can take um, moving forward over the next several years. So I uh, just want to say thank you for everybody who has participated. Um, I know I know a lot of you and you're all strong community supporters. So this has been great. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes before we reach um, 8.30, which was our stop time. Are there any uh, final questions? I'd just like to say one, one more thing. This is Ramsey. I saw a comment in the, um, on the um, Google Doc about no more low income housing. And I just wanted to say, uh, so my job and most of you probably who know me know that what my job is, but it's helping people find housing, usually people in crisis looking for low income housing. 
Um, one of the things I just wanted to state was this year, um, I have a lot of people that don't technically usually qualify for my services, giving us a call, coming through our door. And um, there is definitely a need for more of every kind of housing in Randolph. Um, I've had so many people who've come um, who have um, who have jobs at good good jobs in, in around town or in the area who are looking for housing and can't find housing. A, a number of people who work at GW have called me. You know, they're working at GW and sleeping in their vehicle because there's no housing here for them. Um, and that they have they have really good jobs. Um, if there's more low income housing, there's more. Um, you know, one thing about people who live in low income housing, they spend every dime they make pretty much um, locally on uh, all the things they need. They're not the people who are who are saving all of their money and spending it on giant things like uh, fancy cars and things. They are spending their money locally. Um, there's a lot of need for housing of every kind. And when there's also more market rent housing, then that opens up something that I think there's a, a misconception of what, what, who lives in low income housing. So I just have to make that statement. Thank you. Thank you. Just say that I appreciate Ramsey's comments that all types of housing are needed. Um, we've talked about it for several years, but I think the need is even more than it has been. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I, I really enjoyed Doug Kennedy's presentation. That was a real eye opener, but something that um, really stuck out is we, there's a severe housing shortage in town, but there's also a real um, surplus of bedrooms. And, and I think that graph he showed where there's many single or two people living in houses that have um, many extra rooms or, or designed much bigger. Um, and I've been checking out um, co-housing, which is something that's really taking off I mean, we're not the only community with this problem, of course. Um, this is a problem in a lot of areas, but co-housing is an area where um, the housing is shared, oftentimes with people that work in the same place. And I've heard um, what Ramsey just brought up about co local companies that want to hire people, but there's just no place for them to, um, to live. And um, I think there's some real opportunity to fill up the bedrooms that we have and a lot of those are right in the downtown area as well. So, you know, focus on the, the resources that are there and figure out the best ways to do that, whether that's converting to apartments or, or sharing in a co-housing, maybe intergenerational type um, environment. So, you know, there's, there's some real opportunity for that, I think, as well. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. There is a, a, an entirely separate project, which hopefully we're finding out about soon. Um, that Randolph is involved with with several other towns to look at their zoning for exactly those type of things for right. innovative ways to be uh, doing housing that fits in uh, the community spaces that are out there. And so uh, look forward to uh, notices on that probably uh, there'll be another public meeting on that side of life uh, if we get the money in uh, February or so. So are we all set here, Sarah? We are now at 8.30. Thank you all again for taking time out of your busy busy schedules and evenings to, to spend time with us and think collectively. Um, your input has been so so important and valuable, and we're definitely looking forward to the, uh, the products that come out of this area-wide plan and all the many community discussions and work that will come afterward. So thank you. Okay, great. Have a good evening, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.